So today in building a profitable web design business, we're going to be looking at offerings and pricing. In other words, the choices of the things that you publish, um, that you offer, and how you price those. So we're moving on from your brand and your position and thinking about how you're going to reach your prospects to what is the message that you're going to give them with regard to how you can help solve their problems. So the point of all this is of course to attract the best and most profitable prospects because it's very easy to run an unprofitable web design business. What we're about here is really applying 80-20 in order to make your web design business as profitable as it can be. So just to recap again then, what we've tried to do is to set out to find a point for your business. That means out of all the things that you could be, out of all the things that you could do, we want to find a sharp edge, a tip, where your experience, your skills, your loves and hates and passions and everything comes together in a quite specific area. And where that area also corresponds to a specific point in the market, something that not everybody needs, but some people need. And when they need it, they really need it. So when you've got those two points and they match properly, what you've got is a niche that should be both relatively easy to sell to and also highly profitable. So when you've got your point, what you're doing is you are focusing the value, the benefits that you offer at the point of a focused need as well. Now a sharp need is more urgent, it's more critical, could be desperate, it could be painful, it could be mission critical, business critical. That means that it's going to be worth investing more to solve on the part of your prospects. And what you're setting out to be is the person whose job it is to solve exactly that kind of need. And what gives you the authority or the right to say that? Well, the bottom line is that you declare it. It all starts with you. It's all about word, right? You've got to understand this. Your value to the market starts and ends with you. It is not the market that decides your value. If you go out there fishing for low value clients with low value bait and low value pricing, that's exactly what you're going to get. And as we've seen, the more you specialize, the more you move up market, the more likely you are not only to attract higher value, more upmarket clients, but it's also going to make it easier over time for you to get more of those. We're moving away from the general and into the specific. So we're going to be considering the 80-20 curve as it relates to offerings and pricing. The propositions that you have to the market and how much you choose to price them at. So what does the 8020 curve tell us about what services we should offer and how we should price them? So I've got a few areas where we want to look at and then I'm going to give you some general tips as well. So number one, you need to specialize. So look at this example of an 8020 curve. Now imagine that this is your competition. This is all the web designers in the market that you're ideal prospect might look at, might talk to, might investigate, right, and might see on Google. If this is all your competition and they are ranked by skill level, so there's a lot of relatively low skilled and there's a few very high skilled, right, or that the the height of the graph represents the, the value of the prospects of the projects that they do, or the compensation that they get, you know, the, the level of their fees, you will find that your market probably arranges itself in an 80-20 curve like this. But whatever criteria we're using, where do you want to be? Do you want to be among the most skilled and mo uh, best paid? Or do you want to be down there in the long tail with the rest of them? 
if it represents your skills ranked by value okay it's a complete different way of looking at it we've seen with the 80 20 curve that 80 percent of the time that you spend will generate will be responsible for just 20 percent of the value that you create the minority of the time that you spend 20 percent your top 20 percent of your hours that you invest or the skills that you exercise will actually generate the majority of your profits the majority of the benefits so taking it another way if this represents your skills ranked by the value which skills should you be selling i think the answer to that's pretty obvious point number two you've got to aim high now let's look at your potential target market there's a lot of companies out there who don't have much budget who don't have much value to be gained there are some that could have very high budgets right and very high project values so same deal which end of the graph do you want to be selling to and point number three i want you to think that you've got to discriminate right this is your market what proportion of this market do you want to serve what proportion of this market do you choose to say yes to right now? And which area of that 80-20 curve, that graph there, do you choose to say no to right now? And my fourth point that we're going to look at is I want you to consider, maybe down the line, but consider offering a range of services. If this distribution of the graph now represents the budget that people have got to spend in the market. An important question is, how many of those budgets can you serve profitably? And the key word there is profitably. So we're going to look at that as well in a bit. So let's start with my first point, specialize. Now we know we don't want to be generalists. We want to escape from that. When you're a generalist, you're stuck in the herd. It's very different, difficult to... Uh, distinguish yourself to distinguish the value that you offer and to be noticed so we first need to specify our target market accurately we've done that already then we need to set out to give your ideal customers exactly what they need and right, this is what we did in the positioning this is to say I am the person that does this delivers these kind of goals, tackles these kinds of problems, delivers these kinds of results for companies just like yours. And as I said, it all starts with word. You declare that that is who you are, and then that is who you are. You can't wait to land a customer like that, a project like that, in order to be able to say that is now what you do, because it doesn't work that way. You've got to start by being it. So, as we looked at the 80-20 curve just before, if we apply 80-20 to all the things that you could do, potentially, some of them are going to be more valuable, a lot of the things you could do are going to be less valuable. First, ask yourself, which of those things could be done just as well by other people? Clearly, you don't want to be doing those things, because then you're going to be in a competitive situation. The point of positioning yourself is actually to remove yourself from competition, to distinguish yourself from your competitive market. And we want to exercise our most valuable skills more of the time. So what that means is minimizing commodity skills. So these are skills that lots of other people can do. Other people might do cheaper than you, right? And you've got to maximize the rarer skills. So let's distinguish between what commodity skills are and rarer skills. So website publishing today is a commodity. You can get automated wizards online. You can have get a website for one cent that will let you publish online. Right. So the, um, the magic of getting a website, getting a domain name, getting hosting, that stuff isn't too difficult nowadays. There are two exceptions, though. The first is where you can automate a process. If you can do something automatically that does not require you cranking the wheel, you investing your own time, then certain commodity things like website publishing, like hosting, security, things like that can be profitable. 
The second ex exception is where you can be the best in what you do. There is still room to be the best hosting provider, the best at WordPress security, for example, the best at making uh, mobile websites, right? Because whatever the market is, it's going to follow the 80-20 curve. And when a customer needs the best, somebody's got to be the best, right? And when somebody absolutely needs the very best, they are going to be prepared to pay for the very best. However, for most of us, I think we should be, be very, very focused and very determined to say, right, if this thing that I'm doing right now could be done just as well by somebody for less, you should be paying that person to do it, right? You shouldn't be spending your time doing it. So, what are these rarer skills that we've been talking about? Well, generally, it comes down to strategy. Lots of people know how to make a website. Lots of people can do some graphic design, some SEO. The people who can do it with a strategic objective, now that's rarer. So we're talking about things like understanding your client's market. And by the way, again there, if you concentrate and focus on one particular sector of the market, you're going to understand it better. Helping to define your client's position in that market. Help them to distinguish themselves and helping to craft their message. What should their message be? Where are the benefits? All of that kind of stuff. Now, these things intrinsically are no more difficult than any of the commodity skills. Personally, the idea of WordPress security fills me with dread. It's something I could work out, but I'm never gonna be the best at it. The only thing is, these skills are rarer. Strategic web designers, who really think about their client's profit, their client's position, the branding, all of that kind of stuff. It's just different types of skills. And they just happen to be the types of skills that really matter and are also rare. Plus, all of that stuff is exactly what you've been doing on this video series so far. So the second lesson that we've got from 8020 with regard to what we offer and how we price it is aim high now this is this should be challenging because what i'm really saying to you is wherever you think you should be aiming aim higher than that now i think and i would say to you that whatever you're in if you have identified a niche market you should have a high value consulting offering and by that, I'm talking about the kind of $1,000 an hour type of consulting. Now, the mention of figures like that may be kind of frightening right now. But let me explain why I think it's important. Having a high value consulting hourly rate, which you can publish, by the way, this will serve as a benchmark. Because that says this is what an hour of this person's time is worth to this person's clients. It will also suggest to prospects that this is a rate that you command in the market, right? Whether or not anyone actually pays it is a different matter. But you can say, if you want an hour of my time, if you want my absolute best for an hour or for a day, this is the rate. Plus, of course, there's always room at the top. Every market is going to have people kind of fighting at the bottom, at the lower price point of the market. But there is a hard bottom to any market, right? And that, that, that base, that baseline is called, you know, the difference break even. It's, it's the difference between making a profit and making a loss. And you don't want to be fighting down there. It's mean and dirty down there. There's always room at the top of the market. There's always somebody who has more need, more pain, more budget, more urgency, and is prepared to pay that little bit more to get the very best right now. It doesn't matter what area of life you are in, there is always somebody who is prepared to pay a little bit more. So just let that burn its way into your mind. There is always room at the top. Plus, it's much easier 
to lower a price, and I would say temporarily, and we'll talk about that in a bit, than it is to raise it. If you publish low prices, you can't then turn around to a client and say, and give them a higher quote. But if you say, this is my hourly rate, but for, in this instance and for this reason, I will discount it for you, then they're going to think they've got great value. But you can't put prices up. You can temporarily bring them down. So I would say, any on the subject of, of discounting, always let it be known that your price is your price. Now let's say that you wanted to approach a non-profit or a charity that's related to your particular target niche okay and in this instance you want to work for them for free or you want to work for them for vastly reduced rates which could be for example that um, you're trying to get that first amazing case study okay and we, we mentioned that before now the right thing to do is to say this is my rate it's going to be five thousand dollars for a day i'm going to discount that rate by four five four thousand five hundred dollars okay and you give them a proposal that says five thousand dollars less four and a half thousand dollars the price is 500 for example all right or it might be free but they get a quote that says this is my rate that's the discount this is the reason why okay and that gets signed and it all works according to if they were paying the, f the full rate and the reason why that's important is because you need to know and the client needs to know the value of what they are getting the value of what you are delivering you are delivering five thousand dollar day you are just choosing not to charge them for it and compare that to I'll come and work for free that's almost saying my time is worthless so whether or not anyone ever actually pays your high rate it's worth having explicit your full rate because that is the measure by which everything else that you offer is going to be compared so as i've said never deliver free consulting and this also applies to um, the free website review or free seo review that many people are going to be offering out of there okay so what does that say if you say I'm going to do this for free what's the difference between free and zero value seriously there's no difference right discounting something is different but if you advertise I'm going to spend an hour or two of my time and I'm not going to charge you for it okay that's almost like saying your time has zero value and that's just not true plus if a customer isn't paying for something or if a customer doesn't know how much they're indebted to you for what you're giving them they've got no skin in the game and I cannot stress enough that customers who don't want to pay right at the beginning are not going to want to pay later on do you really want any client who is not prepared to pay for the initial work that you deliver to them do you want any client who is not prepared to pay you if a client isn't prepared to pay you now, why would they be prepared to pay you later? And this may also really suggest that maybe you need to explore how much you value the work that you deliver. If you feel like you're tempted to offer something for free, do you really get the value that you can deliver? So here's my suggestion. Instead of offering the free consulting hour, the free review, the free this, the free that. Offer a review or consulting research service, okay, at your top rate to say, you know, I'll do this and it's going to be 499, right? But what you say is then, if from this review that we do that I'm going to deliver for you, we identify areas where you can use my services, etc., etc., and we decide on a future project because I've done that research work because I've done that analysis because I've looked at your analytics or your AdWords program or whatever it may be because I've done all that that's going to save me time in the future so I will then discount the future project by the same amount 
And that is also going to make them then more likely to hire you again because then they think they're going to get a 499 discount. So another lesson that the 80-20 curve teaches us is you, it's important to discriminate. What that means is that we don't necessarily want to try and serve the whole market. So you need to always be prepared to say no to prospects. It's a good thing to say no. Saying no means that you know the difference between the right kind of prospect and the wrong kind of prospect. You know the difference between the kind of project where you can deliver great value in return for great compensation and the other kind of projects. Now there's always going to be cheap work, there's always going to be the wrong work, there's always going to be opportunities for you to undersell yourself and slum it, right? Saying no means that you are saving yourself, you're saving your energy, your time, your skill, your expertise for the right kind of prospect. As the song goes, you've got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, right? That's the gambler. Now poker players know when to fold. That's probably the most important skill. It's you, you fold early. If you haven't got a good hand, you need to know when to fold. And good poker players fold a lot. So I would say that when you are marketing your own services and your own time, you need to protect that time jealously. And you need to be ready, almost willing and eager to say no to a prospect and to tell them why you're saying no as well. Alongside that, I would also suggest that you need to be happy with the idea of losing prospects based on cost. If everybody is saying yes to you, if everybody is saying yes to your prices, that means that you are not charging enough. So let me show you an actual example of what I mean using the 8020 curve tool that Perry Marshall has had developed, which you can get online at 8020curve.com. So this is the 8020 curve. And let's say, for example, that 80% of the prospects that you speak to, the prospects that you quote, the people that visit your site, whatever it may be, 80% of people say yes to you, right? And the average value of the project that you propose is $2,000, okay? Just arbitrary numbers. Now, if you put these into the Rack the Shotgun tool on 8020 Curve, then this is the output that you get. So what this is saying, that applying that 80-20 distribution, where 80 out of 100 people have said yes to $2,000, okay, that's the pink area on the graph. The people from 80 to 100 on the left-hand side of there, they're the people who said no. That's the 20% who said no. So what this graph is telling us, now if I start hovering over these areas, it can tell me that according to the 80-20 distribution, the, the person in the middle of that, those 80% who said yes, the person at 40%, would have been prepared to pay, what did it say, 4,000, no, 3,633, okay? So, half the people who said yes to 2,000 would have been prepared to pay 3,6 or more uh, not necessarily for exactly the same service, but maybe for a similar service, a similar type of service, right? Now, so if you were to add all these together from 40 through to 1, then you'll find that they are paying an awful lot more than these guys in that lower half. What this is saying, if you changed your price from 2,000 to 3,5, you'd lose half of the people who are saying yes now. But, okay, so you've got 40 times 3, 5, and making almost as much money from half the amount of work. You don't want to have your time filled with work, basically. If you're busy the whole time, you're not charging enough, in other words. Now let's look at the top 20 people, right? This is saying that the top 20 people 
from 23 to 1 would pay 6,600 or more. Right, so that's going to be, what, 120,000, something like that, for only a quarter of the number of customers. That's only a quarter, potentially, of the number of proposals that you put out, the number of phone calls that you have, the number of deals that you have to strike, the number of agreements that you sign, the number of clients that you have to handle. And if you look right at the top, then it's saying that like the third person in there could have a budget of maybe 33,000. Number two could, could be willing to pay 47. Number one could be willing to pay 87, right? But if you're just having uh, 80 clients spending 2,000 each, right, you only need two of the clients like number one instead of 80 paying the low rate. I hope that makes sense. So I would suggest to you that you try a little mental exercise and just ask yourself the question, what if I doubled my rates? Now the most obvious reaction is likely to be, the sky's going to fall on my head, I'm going to be out on the streets, I'm not going to be able to feed my family. Right? I would suggest to you that that's not true. And I would suggest to you that if you are busy right now, then you should certainly give some serious consideration to that exercise. Okay, so, summing up then on uh, the importance of discriminating. We want fewer high-paying clients, and there's many reasons for that, okay? Number one, a high-paying client is more likely to respect your expertise. I can't tell you how many times I've learnt this lesson and people on the Pro Web Design Alliance have come to me with the same thing. They say, I gave this guy a discount, right? I took this client on for cheap and they have kicked me all around the place, you know? The cheaper a client is, the less they pay, the less expertise they think they are buying, right? Get them to pay more. They will be more likely to respect your expertise. They'll be more likely to listen to you. They'll be more likely to take your advice, okay? This kind of client will also then give you the perfect case study, right? They've got a lot invested in it. They want results. They expect the best of you, which is a good thing. You should then expect the best of yourself, and also along with that, you then will not resent the work that you put in. If you sell yourself cheap doing not your best work for not the right kind of client that you don't really care about, that isn't exercising and sharpening your best skills, and you find that you're having to grind away at that, you will resent it. You'll re certainly resent it a lot more than if you were getting paid properly to use your highest value skills on a project that you genuinely care about and want to make a success. Also, as we've said so many times, the highest paying clients will also create the ideal environment to open the door to other similar clients. Right? Highly specialized projects that have got a point that focus on your niche area will open the door to other similar projects for other similar types of clients. So let's move on to offering a range. So what we're saying here is that there is actually money on the table, potentially, at every point in the 80-20 curve. I know I've said that when you're selling services, you want to be looking at the high value end at the sharp end, right? However, we're not just talking about services because there's money all the way through the curve. So yes there's fewer people prepared to pay more and you need to be targeting those people if you're not tapping into that market you should be however there are also far more people also prepared to say to, to pay less now i'm not saying that you should be giving them the same services but you want to maximize the revenue that you get for every hour that you spend of course you do but it's possible to sell the same hours multiple times. And you do that by recording the value of what you do. So that could be by creating books, by creating a premium email list, by creating courses, by creating premium videos that people can subscribe to. You make a video once like I'm doing right now, and you can sell that value again and again and again. So. I'm not going to go into any more detail on this, but I would like you to consider down the line, once you have tapped into the high value service market, that there are 
other slices of that market, similar markets, maybe earlier stages of that market that, that you can access and you can get revenue from? So let's, let's now turn to the question of how to price. So the most important number one distinction that you've got to understand is you've, you must be selling the value that you deliver, not the work that you do. If you're in the business of selling work, selling hours, right? then there's always going to be somebody that can undercut you. There'll always be someone who can sell hours for less than you're selling, right? Don't, you don't want to be in the business, really, of selling work. And by that, I don't mean that we shouldn't ever say to a client, oh, I'm going to deliver, I'm going to give you a day's consulting, right? But what you're actually selling isn't the day's consulting. It's the benefit that they're going to get from the day's consulting or the hours consulting, right? Or the review that you do. So later on, when we talk about the sales process, we'll definitely be focusing on establishing the value of a project, right? When you're talking to a prospect. So what we're saying is that we don't really want to have flat rates for what you do. Now, there is an exception to this, which I'll talk about in a minute, but as far as the market is concerned, you're delivering value, okay? So two hours that you deliver to one client, two hours of work to you, isn't the same as two hours that you deliver to another client. The other client may have a far busier website, may be making far more money. So the changes that you can deliver to them could be worth a huge amount different to the change to the two hours that you the benefit of those two hours that you deliver to, to a smaller client. So I do suggest that we don't really want to be advertising flat rates for all our services. Here's the problem with fixed rates, right? Number one, most basic one, your prospect's budget is almost certainly going to be either higher or lower than any fixed fee that you advertise. So if you say that I make websites and they cost $10,000, there may be a prospect that comes along who's got a budget of about $50,000 and they're going to think, oh, this guy isn't for me. He's well under. You may also have a prospect who comes along who's got a budget of 5000 and they would also be put off. So why would we offer flat rates for a service like advertising fixed rates for whole projects is counterproductive. However, I do believe you can offer fixed rates for what I call, you know, uh, foot in the door pieces of work. Say, for example, the marketing review that, that we talked about. So where you say to a client, I'm going to do this work, I'm going to do it for this fixed consulting rate. And then later on, if you choose to use me again, I, I may discount it. Right. But you don't want to be doing certainly publishing fixed prices on your website for all types of projects that you do. But if you do offer you know, a, a $999 SEO review or branding review or whatever it is your specialist area is, that's also actually quite a good way to filter your prospects because the people who aren't going to be prepared to pay aren't going to be prepared to pay that. The people who are prepared to pay that amount now may turn out to be worth more than that in the future. So that's a great way just to cut off. And I would say that promoting your least valuable skills is doing a disservice to yourself, disservice to the educators who educated you, to the parents that gave you the gift of life and brought you into the world, right? The, do the best that you can do. That's the bottom line. You want to position yourself clear of the commodity market, right? That's in a way saying the same thing. Focus on what you do specially, wonderfully, you know, the, the amazing value that only you can deliver and just put some clear blue water between you and all those other guys who might be doing some similar things but you know make sure that clear blue water is there make sure that you are the only something that's something right get your onlyness statement and just embody that and make sure that that onlyness becomes part of everything that you give out everything that you present and 
because you've got your overall position, right? That's your overall offering is I am this person who does this kind of thing for this kind of market, right? And all the specific services that you may offer on your website, in your books, in your videos, wherever it may be, in your white papers, all of those should be extensions and applications of that core offering, that core proposition that you have. Aim high and price accordingly. If you find yourself too busy, increase your prices. Try doubling them and see what actually happens. And I would say to you that you will probably find that you make more money and have more time to develop your skills and enjoy your work more if you do that. And then finally, structure your range of offerings to be appealing to the best prospects okay, and to put off the wrong ones. If you are finding that you've got a lot of tire kickers coming through the, uh, the filter, the funnel, have a look at the way that you present your offerings and have a look at the prices that you have on there. If you are cheapening yourself in your marketing, then that will explain why you may be getting the wrong prospects through. Okay, But this is 80-20. This is the world of 80-20. We want to make the absolute best use of our time. So if you're going to put a, a proposition out there to the market, take the time to think it through and to make sure that it's going to do that filtering work for you. And absolute final point, always worth mentioning, never discount unless you've got a clear strategic reason to do so. Discounting is permissible. You can do it, but do it strategically. Okay, And do not get into the habit of discounting your fees and dropping your pants for every prospect who comes along. So that's my overview of how you can construct your offerings and set your prices in such a way that it's going to maximize the profitability of your web business. Mm -hmm.